be one final evaluation question. This takes one minute and we would like to get your feedback on our webinar today. So I mentioned that you might even want to upvote questions you see posed by other colleagues so then we know that they are more um, interesting for more people in the audience. You can just put a thumbs up on any comment or questions of other people. So I think that's what I want to say and I stop sharing my screen. I can try at least. And so have I stopped sharing? Yes, now. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start with a with a keynote and we are very happy that uh, Dr. René van Berkele is with us today and uh, he's going to talk about innovation in chemicals, technology management and business models. So approximately the next 15 minutes plus are yours. Over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, thank you to the organizers for inviting UNIDO or the UN Industrial Development Organization to be part of this. So I would like to talk a bit about the overall work that UNIDO is doing and focusing on business models, management, technology, and innovations. So can I have the next slide? Because uh, the slides uh, seem to be moving from your side. So UNIDO is working on inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So that is basically uh, work around factories that are fit for the future because they are uh, doing shared prosperity, environment, sustainability, and economic development. So basically factories that are fit for the future so that industrialization contributes to competitiveness, to uh, to the well-being, and uh, to uh, environment sustainability. So there's a number of topics that uh, fall under this. So if you click one more time, this, uh, this uh, uh, transitional chemicals management is around the circular economy economy, innovation, digitalization, and manufacturing excellence. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so I think that with the chemicals, I won't, don't want to elaborate too much, but the global chemicals outlook, which is basically the UN assessment goes and, and says that basically textile or chemicals are expected to, to nearly double in terms of sales. And there is a transition to more specialty chemicals. So it gets more diverse and more complex in terms of the chemicals in use. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, uh, the, the issue is, of course, uh, how do we uh, deal with the sustainable development goals under the textiles? And that is, uh, uh, that is clear that uh, the, 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 we have the two uh, chemicals related uh, SDGs. Uh, so SDG uh, 3, which is on the healthy side, so the, uh, looking at uh, hazardous chemicals and eliminating them, and then also environmentally sound management of chemicals and all waste under SDG 12. Uh, so sound chemicals, uh, sound management of chemicals and waste cuts basically across the sustainable development uh, uh, goals because it's relevant for achieving much of the uh, agenda which uh, globally uh, has been agreed for for all countries. So we take one more next slide, please. Um, that goes on the kind of uh, what is then the policy direction. I don't want to elaborate on this, but the, here, the whole challenge is to improve the contribution of chemicals to equitable and sustainable development. So increasing the benefits that we get in healthcare and textiles and electronics, while at the same time reducing the uh, environmental impacts. And then we have the traditional way of uh, trying to control, but we see more emphasis going to substitution, innovation and management in the policy hierarchy. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the global chemical outlook uh, uh, has is, uh, was 2019. It was said that the the goal of 2020 for sustainable uh, strategic uh, um, approach to chemicals management was not achieved. And uh, uh, but on the other hand, solutions do exist, and we see that there are a number of trends. So click two, three more times. Uh, so we see that driven by the mega trends, the growth in chemical intensive sectors is is continuing. Agriculture, electronics, but also textiles and therefore more demand for chemicals. Uh, there is a, 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 a number of uh, approaches or opportunities for knowledge sharing, and that's this, uh, this project is uh, contributing to that, uh, that, to save chemicals and to save uh, resources. Front-runner companies are, are doing uh, the right thing, but there is a, a big group of uh, companies which are not yet uh, uh, embarked upon sustainable management of chemicals and waste. And then the last one is uh, basically, uh, one more click, please. Uh, you would see the one on the consumer demand uh, that we, we need to mobilize consumer demand to, to drive these sustainable chemical solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Dr. René, I, I get some indication that some uh, uh, attendees would like you to speak a little bit slower because we have many different countries uh, okay. presented. Okay. Okay. And okay. Uh, oh, let me give you an extra two minutes generously as I am, uh, generous as I am, so that there is no pressure uh, on you. So better yes. to speak slightly slower. We have people from all parts of Asia and beyond, so uh, yes, not everybody yes, is, uh, a, a, is a native apologies, speaker. Apologies, I, I will continue. No worries, so, no worries. I just I wanted to make sure that everybody hears your presentation. Over to you. Yeah. Yes, so I think that the, the, the really the challenge is that chemicals on textiles is, is that, that uh, textiles are so chemicals intensive. So if you look over the life cycle of, uh, of a garment, then approximately one and a half to up to seven kilos of uh, chemicals are needed. Uh, so that means that for every kilogram of garments, we have used a, a multifold of chemicals to actually produce that garment. And that is a big challenge in its own right. Uh, lots of it is in the in the fiber manufacturing, so that is uh, our, our cotton growing uh, in in many cases. But still, we have then the major challenge in the textile wet processing. If you click one more, you see the example of the textile wet processing in there. Uh, so there, it's about 17 percent uh, of by weight. So if you have one kilogram of uh, t-shirts, we have used uh, 17, 170 grams of chemicals to actually manufacture or process this uh, t-shirt. So it's quite chemical intensive and that's a challenge. Uh, if we move to the next slide, we see that this, uh, the, the challenge is that uh, most of the chemicals are just used uh, partially and are then washed out or flushed away and that ends up in textile effluent. So the industry is estimated to be responsible for one fifth, one sixth of the industrial water pollution. And there is an estimated of up to 8,000 synthetic chemicals which are used in textiles and associated garment industry. So it's a huge diversity which adds to the complexity of managing the chemicals. Uh, if we move forward, next slide. That then gives a kind of the traditional uh, risk reduction uh, hierarchy, which we have all known for for probably um, the best part of the last uh, 50 years. So we try to eliminate, if that's not possible, substitute and uh, control and do engineering controls, administrative controls, and then also ultimately uh, the uh, personal protection as the last resort. That is the kind of approach. If you click one more, then from a, a chemicals risk perspective, that has been addressed by the, the moves for chemicals management to more on the administrative and engineering controls and the safe substitutes. But I believe that in the last uh, 15 years or so, if you click one more time, the, the landscape has changed and we see more sustainable chemical innovations, which are addressing at the, the higher level, the green chemistry, green engineering, and at the lower level, more complicated or more, uh, more comprehensive approaches rather to managing chemicals in industrial operations, including textiles. Uh, so these are five uh, topics which UNIDO is working on. So let me uh, try to cover them each in two minutes or so to give a flavor of the type of opportunities that are around. Next slide, please. Uh, so the starting point is chemicals management system. One more click, uh, which is uh, also what uh, ZDHC is, is promoting. So basically minimizing chemical risk to consumers, workforce, the community and environment with a management systems approach. So we go from commitment and assessment, chemicals management, monitor, managing, management review. It's very similar to energy management systems, quality management systems, and so on. And that uh, is then expected to reduce the total cost of chemicals use, so less cost for chemicals, but also improve compliance with applicable legislation and conformance with the standards. So uh, particularly then the elimination of the uh, uh, hazardous or the restricted substances. Uh, so we can extend. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's uh, some of the UNIDO work we have pushed for this notion of smart chemicals management, uh, which are where smart sense them for sustainability, monetary, additional health and safety, resource efficiency, technology transfer and innovation. So try to, to see, uh, not just focus on the chemicals, but see in the processes which are used to chemicals and optimize those processes. We did a pilot in Sri Lanka and different sectors. So if you click one more time, you see some of the benefits that come out. So the potential is really quite significant uh, with chemical reductions uh, on average 40%, energy 30%, uh, waste uh, 20%, hazardous waste up to 40%, and then also significant reductions of industrial accidents. So we should not forget that a lot of chemicals are also causing harm to people. Uh, so there is a, an opportunity to be more comprehensive in the management of chemicals. Uh, that is also part, next slide please, of, of the UNIDO's approach, which is then essentially resource efficient and cleaner production. So we say that we want resource efficiency, so using 
uh, the product, improving the productive use of materials, water and energy, which is on the left hand side, then if we do that, we have less stuff to throw away. So we minimize the generation of waste, effluents and emissions. And then that also improves the worker and human well-being. And that is the, if you click one more time, that is basically a, 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 a virtuous cycle where we improve uh, productivity, uh, improve environmental performance, and then also improve uh, people's well-being, which adds to productivity. So that's the concept of resource efficient and clean production that basically came from waste minimization in the 90s. Uh, so if we apply this next slide, please, uh, just some examples of what is the potential. Then we uh, just put some uh, work which was recently done in Indonesia. Uh, so you see four companies. You see on the bottom line the, uh, the annual cost savings ranging from uh, uh, about 47,000 to up to 1 million. But if you go specifically on the chemical consumption, if you see Argo Pampas, uh, they are 23% chemicals consumption. And you see also water and energy consumption. So the, the, the challenge is that if we or the, the opportunity is that if we choose the right chemicals, we can also minimize on water, on uh, additives, on energy, uh, which gives us a multiple uh, sustainability benefits. Uh, then next slide, I come to the concept of, uh, of chemical leasing. And that is basically a business model uh, where suppliers and users of chemicals work together. So on the left hand side, you see the traditional business model. So a chemical supplier get based on the on the, on the volume of uh, chemicals being used, the kilograms of uh, dyes and additives being used. And the, the, the supplier has an incentive to sell more and that's better for him. And the user has basically an, uh, an incentive to use less because that's less expensive. So in the chemical leasing model, we, we change to a benefit oriented pricing model. So basically you pay on the, on the benefit achieved from the chemical. So that could be a, a square meters of uh, cloth being dyed, or that could be uh, kilograms of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, garments being washed in that sense. And then the supplier has also an incentive to, produce, uh, to provide less chemicals because, because if he, let, he gets a fixed price anyhow per kilogram of, uh, of t-shirts, so in that sense, he has an incentive to provide less chemicals, and that aligns them with the beneficiary company, the user company. So it, it, it started in the car sector basically uh, 20, 30 years ago that car manufacturers pay their paint suppliers per, per properly painted car body that leaves the assembly line, and this can be applied to many other sectors. Uh, next slide is an example, I think, from the textile sector. From, uh, we, 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 uh, the example is from uh, Colombia. Uh, but that doesn't matter. It's a fabricato. It's an integrated weaving and knitting mill where they basically looked at it from the perspective of the sizing product pro process. So before they pay, paid on the basis of the consumption of sizes and additives and a large variety of sizes and uses and high loss in weaving and knitting and high effluent load and also the gel formulation, which is a problem in wastewater treatment. So after that, they pay per uh, meter of cloth, and they use improved sizes, they have a lower effluent load and lower losses. If you click one more, you see the, the, the summary benefits. The annual savings on chemicals are 63% uh, and additives 27% and cost savings are $150,000 for this relatively large uh, uh, textile manufacturer. If you click one more time, uh, you would see, uh, it's probably too, too detailed, but I, I, this can be made available, but it highlights a little bit more the technical details, but you see that there's, there's up to a, a, a two-third reduction of chemicals in some cases, and the, the reduction, the, the diversity of chemicals in use has been reduced from 16 to 2, which makes the management effort also much easier by using more advanced current-day uh, chemicals. Uh, so this has also been applied in the in the textile industry and, and garment industry in Asia. So if you click one more, uh, there's one more time, then you see uh, uh, maybe Brandex, MAS Holdings, and the two of the leading companies in in uh, Sri Lanka are doing this. Uh, it is a bit more uh, difficult to get uh, the actual data on how much benefits are being achieved. But this is an established procedure for larger brands to to go to this chemical leasing. The next slide. Uh, tries to highlight where the niche opportunities are for uh, chemicals leasing. And you see then on the, the, the dotted lines are basically how high the knowledge of the customer is. So the, the higher the knowledge of the customer is on the use of the chemicals, it might be more complicated to uh, introduce them or less advantages to go to chemical leasing. So if you click one more time, so the sweet spot for 
one more time, the sweet spot for uh, chemical leasing, no, that was too much, is really in the use of specialty chemicals in auxiliary process, like we saw the sizing or in the wastewater treatment, where the, the core competency of the, the company is not so uh, high, but which they have to do as an auxiliary process. Once chemicals get integrated in the process, chemical leasing becomes less uh, useful. So it's a bit horses for, for, uh, for courses. Then I go to um, uh, the next slide, please. That is the work on uh, chemi green chemistry. And I think a, a lot has been said in the earlier webinars, but I would really like to say green chemistry is not different from other chemistry. There's no, no difference in thermodynamics or basic sciences, but it's used chemical and chemi chemistry and chemical engineering uh, basically to the application, to the design of chemicals and chemical processes. So you get less pollution, less hazardous uh, materials and more resource efficiency. And the flip side, if you uh, click one more time, is then the green engineering. One more click, which is the uh, which is then the, basically doing the same, but applying this uh, uh, environmental mindset or sustainability mindset to the design of uh, uh, operating systems, so that they use less energy and resources in a more sustainable way. Um, one more slide, and that's uh, then probably for those uh, click twice. Uh, is is basically the this the thing that the, this uh, uh, green chemistry and green engineering are basically driven by kind of heuristics for the design of chemical processes and chemicals, and they are listed on the twelve principles of green chemistry, twelve principles of green engineering, and those have also been promoted in with Unido's work on the, the green chemistry toolkit, which is online to learn about these opportunities. If we click one more time, then you see where uh, in Unido's uh, where view a lot of the a the action is is around no novel solvents. So if you click one more time. That's the the work on the uh, supercritical carbon dioxide, which has been Dico and some others have been working on that. And novel reactions, basically using catalysts and enzymes. So called then in bleach. One more, the low temperature bleaching aids, and then the new equipment using ultrasonic uh, microwaves for bleaching. Uh, two more times. I think click. Uh, the microwave irradiation for print fixing, and uh, the third one is microwave uh, dyeing pretreatment. So there's opportunities out there. Uh, so if you click one more time, uh, we have on the Green Chemistry Toolkit uh, website we've uh, identified uh, 20 uh, key innovations on uh, on uh, green chemistry for textiles and textile processing. Uh, so just log on on site, you can see what is uh, what is the technologies there. Some are more on the material preparation or the fiber uh, processing, and others are more on textile uh, processing itself. I think a particularly interesting next slide, please. Uh, a particularly interesting area is the, the, the sort of the emergence recently, which we see with natural dyes. Uh, so two companies are highlighted here. That's uh, KB Coles, which is manufacturing natural biocolors from uh, the biodiversity of India. So it's basically growing microorganisms, algae and bacteria, and then get a highly reproducible and versatile uh, uh, textile dyes. And the other company is uh, T. Hoos from, uh, uh, from Sri Lanka, which basically takes the iced tea waste uh, from, uh, um, from Unilever and uses that to, to create 15 shades of, uh, of, uh, uh, for garment dyeing. And if you click one more time, these are just some of the innovations which are proposed by Fashion for Good. Uh, in, in order to come to some kind of conclusion, then next slide, please. I think that uh, we are talking about, uh, of course, the circularity. Uh, we see that chemicals are largely used in a single-use model, so they are used in the process and they get wasted or they get recovered with the, the, the textile fabric, but they're not necessarily used there. So we need to find uh, solutions of the textile industry collaborating with the, the chemical industry to reduce the net discharges on the environment. So I think that uh, the circularity for textile chemicals is is not not really on the, on the focus. We focus much more on the fiber, but we need to to have uh, textile chemicals which are conducive to achieving this circularity for the the main fabric which is out there. Uh, as a wrap up, next slide. Uh, perhaps I think that uh, sums up uh, what what we would like to see. We were we would like to see basically less consumption of chemicals, less hazardous chemicals less impacts and less risk with more added value, more benefits. And that could then be uh, the collaboration of expertise and minimization, optimization of processes as a contribution to the circular economy. 
so sorry I uh, had to uh, rush a little bit through this. This is uh, just a snapshot uh, of uh, some of the UNIDO work. Uh, next slide, there are some references to some of the websites where you can find some reference materials on the chemical leasing, on the green chemistry toolkit, and on resource efficiency clean production. Uh, so we'd be happy to, to elaborate more on these uh, overall topics, but I guess that the, the challenges, that the, the, the sustainability challenges are so big that we need innovations at all levels. So we need innovation at chemicals, at the technologies that use chemicals, at the, the business processes and the, the auxiliary process, and then also the business models with, for example, chemical leasing. Thank you very much. Oh, back to you. Thank you very much, René van Berkel. Um, I wanted to ask if we can maybe uh, share the links already from the presentation in the chat so that colleagues can save them the, in their bookmarks. I think this was an excellent, I, I'm sure everybody agrees, excellent start for our conversation. And I'm coming back to you, René, with some one or two follow-up questions, if time permits. Uh, but I want to bring our other four colleagues into the conversation. So um, let me start with actually Rakesh Vazirani, the head of sustainability services of TÜV, TÜV Rhineland, India. And I will, um, I wanted to ask him, I mean, we heard a lot about challenges and also already some innovative solutions, but for you, Rakesh, what are the biggest challenges manufacturers are faced with that they are not using green chemicals? All right. Thank you, Jos, for that. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rene, for those insights. I, I feel bad uh, that I am being asked to spoil the party after all the great and positive work that we heard from UNIDO. So on behalf of uh, our colleagues who work with uh, manufacturers, uh, mills, let's say, and wet processing units, chemicals manufacturers, but also NGOs and associations, uh, I, I would share some of the learnings what we've seen. Uh, like many of the experts uh, that have joined us, we look at chemistry as fundamentally two aspects, the way it's applied. One is, first of all, understanding chemistry. And the second part is making things. And both of them depend on measurements. So what is uh, the challenge then? Let's stick with the topic of chemistry. I would use the acronym KEMI, K-E-M-I. The first one with K, it's a topic of knowledge and ability. Uh, when chemistry is being applied by manufacturers, um, they need to have that understanding of that chemistry, what's the potential functional usage and the ability. How should they define the greenness? How should they define uh, what they are doing? That kind of understanding is necessary, but lack of that understanding or ability is a problem. So that's the K. The, the second part is with regards to the thinking and the approach today of thinking of the ends. I'm getting that finish. As long as I'm getting that finish, well, the green part can be left on the side. If I'm getting uh, a functional wear which is saving lives, we don't have the time yeah, to, to make sure it is green. Uh, if I'm giving the functional wear that the user wants, we don't have the time to make it green. But conversely, when companies are able to look at the bigger picture, particular level, but the overall picture of how the chemical is being used about the overall end, it helps them. The third part is the M. Rene mentioned that, you know, there are many things that have to be looked at. It's the chemical, the business process, is the production process. There are so many moving parts and interconnected parts that it also, in many cases, leads to inertia not to move at all, not to change at all. And finally, the I, and perhaps that's one of the major drivers, it's the incentive. Whether that incentive is from policy perspective or that incentive is from financial perspective. So laws, regulation, financial incentive, yeah? So I would say those KEMI, K-E-M-I, that's kind of uh, the challenges, but that also has the answers to move further. Thank you very much, Rakesh, for introducing Kemi here. So actually, let me go spontaneously back to Dr. René and ask him, uh, in, in, in your opinion, where do you see that uh, the challenges that the concept of benefit-oriented approach is yet not broadly implemented or, let's say, widely known? 
I I I, I agree that uh, there are many challenges, and and I think I think the, the the really the biggest challenge is 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 perhaps the knowledge that people are just not aware that there are alternatives, and that are also not aware that uh, alternative business models like chemical leasing could be applied. So that is a bit uh, bit of a, of a of a challenge around there. I think in terms of the incentives, which was also highlighted, I mean, the, the, the ones who, the companies which are a part of global value chains and supplying to major brands are, are starting to get involved, uh, but are not necessarily uh, uh, coming to, to all the suppliers. So uh, I was giving some examples which are clearly leading edge and are not uh, uh, mainstream yet. And that is uh, still our, our challenge, as I was also saying with the global environmental outlook. There are good practices, but we still need to... Uh, pull up our socks and, and make it happen in a much larger number of uh, enterprises. And that is uh, still a challenge. I believe it's also still a, a challenge that uh, many smaller enterprises uh, feel that this is an agenda which they've been told to do and they don't necessarily see the benefits for themselves. So uh, uh, and, and that's uh, the benefits in terms of having better employee uh, occupational health and safety, which will give them a higher report ability and higher uh, productivity in their workforces. So it's sort of many of the benefits are not yet there because there's not an understanding of how they, how these these issues are material to business success. I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, René. Let me bring Prasad Pant into the conversation. He's a director for the ZDHC Foundation Roadmap to Zero program based in India. Um, Prasad, I mean, what is ZDHC doing to help manufacturers in decision making using green chemicals? And maybe I just add a second question right away on um, how ZDHC is driving the textile and leather industry towards using greener chemicals. Uh, thank you, Just, and um, uh, thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Uh, I think uh, ZDHC has uh, made a paradigm shift uh, in the way uh, the textile and leather industry is looking at uh, green chemistry. And uh, the main paradigm shift that I'm talking about is instead of looking at end of pipe, we are looking at input chemistry as the main focus. I mean, the whole uh, concept or philosophy of ZDHC is that if you have clean inputs, then you, you did not worry about your outputs. Uh, uh, having said that, I think with the uh, MRSL, that is the Manufacturing Restricted Substances List that ZDHC has uh, come out with since 2016, uh, we have, first of all, helped to uh, what Rakesh mentioned, help the industry understand, you know, what are what are the restricted substances that we need to eliminate and try to harmonize it, try to uh, synchronize the different lists which were there out in the market. That's, that's the first uh, uh, support that we are giving. The second, I think, is to uh, digitize uh, the decision making uh, for the supplier. Uh, Rakesh mentioned uh, the K part, that is the knowledge and understanding of chemistry by the manufacturers. Unfortunately, I don't think I agree with him because as a textile manufacturer, you are not so well aware of what are the chemicals, what is the chemistry that is being used. You are more uh, 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 concerned with the effect, you know, whether the shade is correct or the finish is correct or the functional finish uh, properties are there. So uh, it was a big challenge for ZDHC to uh, un help the suppliers understand whether they are buying the right MRSL uh, compliant uh, chemicals or not. And for this, we uh, developed the ZDHC gateway. So it is, it's a digital platform, which is the world's largest database of, of MRSL conformant or safer chemicals. I'm, I, I'm not exactly saying that these are all green chemicals, but at least they are MRSL conformant chemicals or safe uh, chemistry. So a supplier or a manufacturer uh, simply logs in, uh, registers on the gateway. Uh, it is it is for free, and he can access a database of uh, ZTHC MRSL conformant chemicals and compare his inventory. So it is just the commercial names that he is comparing, and he can make a decision as to whether he should use this chemical which is there in his inventory or search for alternatives from the gateway. So I think with the MRSL and with the gateway, we have provided a very simple solution for the textile and leather industry uh, 
to to sort of look at safer alternatives and look at safer chemistry. Thank you, Prasad. I think there are many good reasons to use green chemicals, right? And I heard them in the last two weeks and already here. Uh, Dr. Klaus Kümmerer, uh, who's a professor at the University of Lüneburg and a well-known expert in the field. Maybe can you tell us one more time in how can green chemicals contribute to sustainable life cycles of products? I mean, what can we say to people who are skeptical? And come maybe from the from the green side here. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the question. Um, first of all, I think it's not just about green; it's about sustainable. And green has to fit in about sustainability, and it's not synonymous. I think that's very important to understand. A lot of people think, yes, we're doing here something a little bit, and there something a little bit, and then we are greener, or they say we are green. We are not just comparing, and you can only compare, you are, they are, think they are greener, or they just say, now we are sustainable. Yeah, maybe by addressing one or, in good cases, two principles of the 12 principles. Yeah, but that's all only going down to, to the chemicals and the products. But what is it all about? It's about service and function we need. Yeah, and that's the broader picture, the picture of system thinking. And yes, we. I think this broader picture we also have to deliver to, to the uh, companies, but on, not only to them in terms of system thinking, also the consumers are of important. And we have to better understand the interplay of carrots and sticks in terms of le legislation and in terms of incentives. And also, um, how should I say, um, we need a, a maybe a bit, little bit longer perspective. Uh, the substitution of chemical A by chemical B, it's fine, but it's, how should I say, there's a danger that after two years, there's a new chemical. And then as a, as a manufacturer, I would say, hey, I just adapted two years ago and it took me two years until my processes worked nicely again. Yeah. So um, this has to be also taken into consideration uh, in the terms of feasibility. And therefore, again, we need a broader thinking. Yeah? Um, chemical leasing is part of this, but chemical leasing also includes uh, I would say do, uh, doing not only uh, uh, less, but sometimes doing without nothing. Yeah, and al mm. also it has to, to to be about the lifetime of the products. So a chemical itself could be green or greener uh, if you think about its manufacturing and it's about uh, some of its processes. But um, really becoming greener needs a bigger picture and really becoming more sustainable needs a bigger picture and even if it's a greener chemical it's not necessarily fitting better into a circular economy and it's not necessarily uh, becoming more sustainable and it has been mentioned already knowledge uh, is very important here sharing knowledge education is part of it sure but it's not all so we need uh, to better understand how can we make uh, companies and especially also the smaller ones cooperate better and to share the experiences. And then we can identify also some greener chemicals. But even if, just to come to an end, even if it's a greener chemical, if the tonnage is going up, yeah, maybe that's not greener in the end. Mm -hmm. Professor Klaus, I, a short follow-up question because I want to bring Ulrich into the into the conversation. I think as a manufacturer, he has a lot to share here. Um, Professor Klaus, um, I heard the argument several times in the last weeks about that also often green chemicals um, are, are cost savings in the production, right? They can bring cost savings in the production. Not always, I understand, but often. So uh, why they are not widely used uh, by manufacturers? What's what's I mean, they're not yeah. thinking economically here, or why, what's the challenge here? Um, on the one hand, I think there have been experiences that, as you mentioned, not each green, not chemical saves really costs. Or the question is, on which timeline does it save costs? Short term or long term? Yeah. And also introduction, as I mentioned already, new chemicals also creates costs. And maybe that's also part of the fast fashion that's uh, not only on the consumer side uh, but also on the manufacturer side yeah you have to adapt and adapt and adapt yeah and you just uh, uh, finished adapting with a and then 
B is coming up. So we have mm -hmm. to decelerate all these things also. And then I think that then it, again, it relates to knowledge. Access to knowledge takes time. Education takes time. Yeah. Therefore, we have to de decelerate. We also have to reduce complexity. There's a lot of competition. I have a greener chemical. And as I mentioned already, often it's only one criterion that is met. And this has to be better understood or asked for or standardized. Mm. Thank you, Professor Klaus. I want to bring Ulrich Hangsleden into um, the conversation. As you know, he's a global business development manager. He was with us also last week. Ulrich, of course, I, I invite you also to comment what you have heard so far, but also would like uh, to hear from you how Dystar contributes to the resource efficiency in wet processes, because that's one of the uh, um, solutions you're offering, right? So Ulrich, over to you. Yeah, thank you again for invitation. And for the question, of course, also, um, yeah, one word to the to the green chemistry. Sometimes also the performance. Yeah? <laughs> you have to be greener with your with your chemistry, but sometimes the performance uh, is not as good as before. W one simple example: in the past, there were so-called uh, direct dyes with benzo or uh, benzo dyes. They were yeah normal direct dyes, but the fasteners could be improved by um, an after treatment with copper sulfate formaldehyde. <laughs> can you imagine? Nowadays, you cannot do that, but the fasteners profile was good. The light fasteners was really uh, uh, outstanding, but longer you cannot do. Now we have this uh, quaternary ammon sulfates and other cationic fixing agents. They are also good, but they reduce the light fasteners. Hmm. Uh, yeah, but that was not your question. Your question was how we can contribute to the resource efficiency in wet processing. So at Dystar, some years ago, we developed so-called Kadira concepts. Kadira, the meaning of Kadira is carbon dioxide reduction. And under this roof, we collect all application processes which offer significant savings in regard to water, to steam, to electricity consumption. So actually, we have 11 individual Kadira modules for cotton, for wool, for polyester, for polyamide, as well as for fiber blends and for denim, including also laundry of denim garments. And all these different Kadira modules they contribute to saving of minimum 30 to 50 percent of water, 20 to 50 percent of electricity, and also 20 to 50 percent of steam. Yeah. Additionally, DICE also developed so-called opti dye programs. These computer programs, which are nowadays integrated in our online tool Elliot, can be used free of charge. So everybody can uh, register for Elliot and then uh, you can use these programs. And the Optida programs were developed to optimize the dyeing processes, optimize dyeing recipes, or to show where possible problems are to be expected for cold per batch dyeing, for example. You should know how sensitive your dyes are against hydrolysis. Uh, and so Optida CR for cold per batch can help in this case. And at present, we have Optida programs for the cellulose dyeing, for cold per batch and exhaust, a program for polyester dyeing and exhaust, one for polyamide and exhaust, and another one for cellulose dyeing with our inner train, with our wet dyes and exhaust, and also continuous process. And with the support of these programs, shorter and optimized dyeing cycles will be calculated, which leads to lower operation costs and improved quality of the dyed articles. And in most cases, it will also lead to better transfer of the lab. Uh, recipes from lab to bulk and bulk to bulk, and that also reduces the number of dye additions. And in the end, you have yeah lower consumption of resources, which overcompensate possibly costs of more expensive green chemistry. Yeah. Ulrich, uh, just a quick follow-up question, and I think yes. it's related to to CO2 tax. Um, how yeah. would a possible CO2 tax affect the price of the garment and and, and actually who pays mm -hmm. for it yeah also good question thank you the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas 
gases are exhausted in each step of the textile production. Uh, there was a McKinsey study in 2020, and they said in 2018, around 15% of the total greenhouse gas emissions were generated during the wet processing. And that part is where we at Dysar can support. Well, but there is no CO2 price tag which you can put on the piece of garment. I would give you an example. A black dyed golf polo shirt made from polyester or from cotton, you can bought in the shop at an ever, average price of, let's say, 55, 60 US dollar. And even if this shirt is dyed with a high performance dispersed dye on polyester, like Dynix Black XF2, 300%, or with a reactive dye on cotton, like uh, Rematsu Super Black Sam, both dyes are rigid and uh, CTHC Gateway 3. So even if you use this dye, the cost for the dye stuff per shirt is marginal. For a golf shirt made from polyester, the cost is approximately 0.25%. And for the cotton-based shirt, the cost is approximately 0.1% in relation to the selling price. So it's almost nothing. Looking to the cost in processing for polyester or cellulose in dye house, it's a different story. Then the part is around 25 to 30 percent. But in both cases, you can work with an optimized process, which saves then resources. In the end, you have a longer lasting polo shirt in hand with better fastness profile. And we have the tools in hand to reduce the resource consumption. The success of this Kadira concept depends on whether dye houses are willing to invest some work and whether they are really want to change something. Mm. Yeah, and sometimes for dye houses, I, I understand that very well. I work a long time in a dye house. It's difficult to change a winning team, never change the winning team. A dye house have to do production. And if they have a good working process, they don't want to change, even if they uh, yeah, consume more resources than necessary. But they have a right for some production, which they don't want to change. Thanks, Ulrich. Um, let me bring Rakic back into the conversation. And um, I mean, TÜV Rhineland, as a, I understand you're a service provider. TÜV is working for both sides, buyers and producers. So what can you as a service provider do to make use of this um, this insider knowledge, the knowledge needed to drive the sector forward being more sustainable. So we talked about the knowledge you introduced us to Kimi, right? So knowledge was one of your your letters there. Right. So uh, like, like you rightly mentioned, and from what we've heard, we keep focusing on knowledge. And uh, again, when we talk of chemistry and greener chemistry or how to make sure good chemistry is used in a way that is greener, it's about understanding what those chemicals are and understanding how things are made. But both of those topics depend on measurement, on measurement. And as a service provider, when we have a, a mill who's talking about application of a newer chemical and the potential impact, then measurement of which harmful substances are not in there in this newer chemical measurement on reduce energy usage reduce water usage in the process when that new chemical is introduced so that's one part yeah one part of us is offering services measuring based on analytical activities and the second part is hand holding and with capacity with knowledge uh, making them understand the overall concept not just of the safety data sheet to the mill but also of the technical data sheet with regards to what is the process in which the chemical should be applied? What will be the boundary? What will happen with extra force, extra heat? What could be the potential impact? But at the same time, we also utilize all of this knowledge when GIZ, let's say, thinks of the ecosystem. When GIZ brings together policymakers, when GIZ brings together universities, when GIZ brings together associations, that's also where we engage uh, and share uh, information based on objective facts that we see. Yeah? So, of course, all of us have our subjective opinions, but as a service provider, we work uh, to carry out analysis on standards. 
and that's what we are good at. Mm. We utilize standards and we share. And the other important aspect is we also are sharing what we see in other industries. For example, in Europe, for all the printing inks used with food packaging, they have a positive list approach. So it is not negative screening. Do I have this substance? Yes or no? Do I have this substance? Yes or no? Do I have this substance? Yes or no? But they have a mega positive list. If you want to use that chemical, that printing ink, it needs to be there. To be there, it has to go through overall analysis of what to be the overall impact of that chemical. Yeah. So um, we also share these ideas from other regulatory frameworks that uh, associations, that industry, that policymakers, we also able to see if some of that can be relevant to, to the textile sector. Thanks, Rakesh. Um, a few more questions, and then I want to open the floor by also asking Gundolf maybe to highlight two, three questions. Um, maybe first to Prasad. Um, we talked, uh, we heard also uh, in Rene's presentation, we heard a lot about innovative approaches and so on. So, in your opinion, what kind of innovative approaches, innovations in sustainable chemistry should the chemical, chemical industry focus on? So, yeah, yeah, I think uh, Rene really highlighted this key point, uh, which is about innovations. I think Rakesh also talked about innovations in the I part. I think innovations are, is something that will drive this uh, greener chemistry or sustainable chemistry. Uh, I think uh, from my point of view, uh, the first thing that chemical formulators can look at for innovations is to look at the substances which are listed in the candidate list of our MRSL. So the candidate list is actually those substances uh, which are known to be harmful, but where maybe the scalable safer alternatives are not there uh, currently. So we need, they can look at this candidate list and look at how they can uh, eliminate these substances from their portfolio. So substances like formaldehyde or aniline or D4, D5, D6 in, in silicon uh, manufacturers or softeners. So that is the first part that I would look at. The second would be uh, how we can really look at benign chemistry, you know, the chemistry which inherently is not as hard as so. Uh, I mean, we have examples such as the enzymes, you know, where they deactivate when they are exposed to the environment. So looking more and more at benign chemistry would really be the, should be the focal point of innovations. Also, uh, the chemical industry can look at multifunctional uh, applications of the same chemical. So today we have so many chemicals which are being used for very, very specific purposes. So maybe we can try and combine uh, uh, single usage of uh, the applications, you know, for such chemicals. And lastly, I think uh, uh, the chemical industry should look at integrating uh, all the innovations into uh, resource efficiency, link it with technology, link it with uh, productivity increase. And uh, uh, last but not the least, all these should be scalable. So when we are, we, we are today getting so many examples of uh, very novel technologies, say whether it is probiotics or whether it is uh, dyes made, made from algae or softeners made from algae or uh, or from bacteria. So these are kinds of ideas which are which are being generated, but are they really scalable? I mean, we will have to look at scalable innovations uh, to mm. really make a step change in the industry. Okay. Thanks, Prasad. Thanks, Prasad. Um, um, René, um, I hear an echo, but René, um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you talked about chemical leasing and I got from different channels I have here on my table, uh, people asking me, uh, you they want to learn more about chemical leasing. Um, so I understand chemical leasing has a strong potential to offer mutual benefits, both to business and sustainability, right? So can you maybe summarize or elaborate a little bit more and is there any good uh, case study on chemical leasing in the textile industry already? I mean you mentioned one country I think but. Yes 
Yeah, so so the basic uh, the basic idea is that you you as a, as a producer as a manufacturer of textiles and garments you pay for the performance being delivered by the chemicals. So that is your square meters of uh, fabric being printed or your uh, kilograms of yarn being dyed, which you you pay. And that and the, and then the incentive is there for your chemical supplier to advise you on what chemicals are best and what chemicals can achieve the best outcome for uh, the different uh, applications. And that overcomes the point which was highlighted already a few times that, that manufacturers are often short on the detailed chemical knowledge of the different products. And we see we, we also deal with it that most of the chemical products are brand names or chemical formulations where we don't know for exactly what is the chemical composition. So as a, as a, as a, as a chemicals user, which is the dye houses and the garment washers, they, they have no, no full understanding of the chemistry involved and therefore they have to buy products and they buy products to kind of achieve a good outcome, which uh, uh, Ulrich was also saying, so uh, don't change it. But on the other hand, there is the benefit for that. So once you, uh, you, you uh, enter into a chemical leasing arrangement, you try to set out what is the current base le baseline level of the price for a certain process and you agree on uh, with the supplier of the chemicals that you, you will pay the same price per square meter or per functional unit afterwards. And then the chemical supplier comes in and advises you on how to minimize the cost. And he will have a, a benefit because he has to supply less chemicals. And you as a, as a manufacturer have also the benefits in terms of less wastewater treatment or uh, other benefits which are there. I mean, in terms of uh, well-documented case studies, it's it's a little bit difficult because many of those are commercial in confidence. But the, the one which I mentioned from Colombia was a, a really two-third reduction of chemicals and $150,000 savings annually uh, for a, a, a medium-sized uh, weaving and, and knitting mill. So that gives you some examples. But the examples in, in, in Sri Lanka have also focused on, for example, on wastewater treatment because it's an auxiliary process for, for textile manufacturers. So you don't have the necessary knowledge. So they pay on a certain on a, on a, on a charge for the cubic meters of effluent being treated. So you give a chemical supplier uh, the, 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 the cost there and the chemical suppliers can make, they, can, they would, would, would basically change from selling the chemicals to selling the chemical knowledge which is embodied to be efficient. Same worked in the car industry where, where the, 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 the paint manufacturers are, are uh, operating in the assembly plants and are advising on how to properly paint the cars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. So I have two more short questions for one for Dr. Klaus and one for Mr. Ulrich. And then I want to open up because I think if I see it correctly, there are a couple of interesting questions coming through the chat and uh, Gundolf who has a task to, to monitor them a little bit and highlight them and um, so that I can properly listen to all of you. And I'm learning a lot. Dr. Klaus, um, one more time. How can we overcome the fear of of uh, chemicals or green chemicals and seeing that using the right chemicals provides a lot of opportunities? So in a nutshell, you have the, the one minute uh, opportunity to speak to the right people. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, it was already mentioned, we need positive lists and criteria what is on the list and not, not this huge uh, uh, number and amount of chemicals. We have to go for reduction. Uh, to the same with less and uh, maybe a much broader picture and um, we have to understand by the way there is no benign chemistry chemistry is chemistry it depends on how we use it and how we apply it also for bio resources uh, if it's not coming from waste it will have to grow direct that directly it's not a greener thing it's often worse because it needs, needs water and the same holds for renewable resources um, but to, to summarize um, uh, a broader thing, I would summarize, textiles are still too cheap. Sorry. And the producers, the manufacturers have to pay the price in the end and the people working there and the environment. And this we also have to change. So we have to come from a use of textiles, a service oriented textile, use it longer, not fast fashion, long fashion, uh, appreciate what you have and try to establish an offer a business where you care, where you repair, repair service, etc. And that's really greener and more sustainable. And 
then using the appropriate chemicals and materials allowing this. Mm. I, I think I can read a little bit here the agreement in the group. Um, Ulrich, um, what could the chemical formulator still do more to increase the use of green chemicals? Maybe you can just add on from a manufacturing point of view. Sorry, my forgot to turn on micro. No, no, it's better. Uh, first, before I answer your question, I want to say thank you to Dr. Klaus. <laughs> we have to reduce the number of chemicals we use. Um, that is easy to say for me, but my problem is uh, I work with Dystar, and Dystar have a long history, 150 years of Dystar uh, knowledge. Uh, Dystar was founded by the company Bayer Hoechs, uh, BSF ICI Seneca. Because of that, we have a huge portfolio of products. We have already more than 1,600 products listed in the Blue Sign Finder. We published over 2,300 Dyser products in the ZTHC Gateway at level 3, meeting the ZTHC MSL 2.0. And more than 2,100 products are selected to meet the requirements of Ecotex or standard 100 by Ecotex. That makes it even for us complicated to say which products are suitable for which uh, RSL. So I mentioned already this earlier tool. In this earlier tool, you find 28 positive lists. Different retailers and brands RSLs are there, including uh, gods and other organization. So in this positive list, you only find the products which can be used for this uh, specific RSL or Ecotex standard or whatever. The price uh, for these cleaner products are not much higher than the prices of commodities. As mentioned before, greener chemistry is not a different chemistry, it's only cleaner. Yeah, we, we take a look to the edicts that we use for the synthesis to make sure these products fulfill these requirements and they are clean. What we have to do is, from my point of view, we have to learn to discuss about the total cost of production, including possible environmental costs, and stop the discussion just about the price per kilogram. In most cases, a little higher product cost, possibly higher product cost, can be overcompensated by the use of innovative processes. And that leads in the end to lower cost, lower total cost and reduced resource consumption. So more training, more knowledge is necessary to, uh, yeah, to use more of these green chemicals. That's all from my side, yours. So now I have to unmute myself too. So thank you very much to all five of you for this sharing of a very interesting perspectives and knowledge. I want to invite now Gundolf. I made my life a little bit easier today and ask him while I'm engaging in a conversation with all five of you to monitor the chat and see what kind of questions are coming in and try the difficult task of prioritizing a little bit uh, what questions we still want to ask in the next 15 20 to 20 minutes. Gundolf, um, can you throw to us some some questions? Yeah, thank you very much. So I think some of the questions are partly answered already. Nevertheless, I would try I would I want to take them up in a bit differently, um, different way. So for example, one question is about if it's possible to achieve the same quality as per customer requirements now when we're mm -hmm. using greener chemistries. It was somehow already uh, answered in a way. Yes, there are some difficulties. Nevertheless, I would like to ask René van Berkel, if you consider the whole concept of green chemistry, greener chemistry, chemical leasing, how you incorporate in this concept the customer requirements? And to Ulrich, I would like to ask um, what you answering on this question to your customer. Yeah, what are you doing in a way of train them, consider whatever. 
first to Rene. Yeah, I think it, it's it's a uh, it's difficult to answer the question in the general in the generalization. So there are uh, green chemical solutions or better sustainable chemicals alternatives which are which are obviously meeting and exceeding current product specifications. There are ones which are not yet there. Uh, so I, that that is uh, that is clearly the case, and the, the the matter of performance is also linked to how well the process is then controlled. So it's not only the chemical, but it's also the whole process of how it's being applied. I believe, though, that uh, one should take as a as a starting point that the customer is king. So uh, that that uh, the existing uh, specifications should be the design or the desired outcome from uh, any uh, uh, green chemical solution that we would like to propose. But I would also like to iterate that uh, somewhat, and sometimes we have noticed that uh, uh, buyers are demanding just uh, out of routine uh, certain specifications, and not necessarily that these are always as cast in stone as one would like to see. Uh, so there are there are uh, different colors of pink prescribed and uh, people could probably get a, a, a slight shade of this with a, a less uh, harmful chemicals or dye stuffs. And that should then not be, uh, it should not be, uh, hardly be noticeable to the customer. So there is also a need uh, for, for the dye house and the manufacturers to get into a conversation with uh, uh, their buyers and say, you want this, I can do that, but it involves quite hazardous chemicals. I can do something which is maybe slightly different, but uh, very close to it. And then I can do it with, with more environmentally benign chemicals. So it's also a matter of conversation. So I, I think it's an anchor point or starting point is what the customer demands. But uh, not to to the nth degree of that. That is a holy grail. Uh, there are uh, demands are, are shifting, and there would be uh, opportunities to to kind of moderate to get to something which is very very close, but much more benign chemicals. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rene. Before we go over to Ulrich, maybe Klaus, you wanted uh, to comment on that, right? Maybe very short, and then over to Ulrich for the second part of the question. I just wanted to add, um, as René mentioned, as far as I understood, you have habits, you have a history in your company and often you use chemicals and you do not even understand anymore why. We have heard from Ulrich a long history, but all, each manufacturer and producer. So the person introducing a certain chemical, maybe at that time for good reason, they have left the company, retired, whatsoever. So go back to the history and try to understand why a certain chemical was used. And I'm sure we will find several times, oh, we do not understand anymore, or there is no real need anymore. And then you just use it, not again, not anymore, saves money, saves resources. Then you are really greener and more sustainable. Thanks, Dr. Thank Klaus. Ulrich. Yeah, again, me. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Klaus, absolutely. There are some products also in our product portfolio uh, which we have because the customer want to use them. We know that there are better products available, greener products or better technology, but the customers want to use these products since ages, since ages, and they don't want to change because then they have to change all their recipes. We don't talk about five or ten recipes. Sometimes we are talking about thousands of recipes which need to be reworked and they don't want. They say we want to still use this product knowing that the ecology is maybe not the best or the performance is not the best. Mm. So what we do uh, is, of course, a regular training, training of our internal stuff, the global BDs. We are uh, in the moment six in Raunheim in Germany located. So we train our internal dye stuff, stuff worldwide. Uh, in case of this Gadira modules or use of Optidile programs, but also uh, in regard to yeah, SETI uh, C conform products or GOTS conform products, that is common nowadays. The customer asks us which products we, they can use for GOTS. But it's not only the ecology, it's always also a discussion about fastness, about metamerism, about uh, yeah, different technical issues which the products need to fulfill beside the ecological use. And for that reason, we have developed this Elliot tool. In Elliot, you first take a look, does my product fulfill all the ecological requirement? 
in the next step, you can go in the product finder where you can search for the former selected product. Do they also fulfill my technical requirements? In, in the next step, we also will integrate a color match prediction program where you can make directly your match prediction for the selected products. So training is an essential uh, part of my job. Uh, not only internal, but also going to customer and train them how to use the best uh, possible products and technology. Okay, thanks Ulrich. I just wanted to point out in case someone has to leave earlier, um, we have another 15 minutes to go. I hope you stay with us, but in case we have to leave earlier, there is a link in the chat for providing the uh, announced mini feedback. We would appreciate it if you click on that and give us your one minute uh, feedback. It doesn't take more time. Gundolf, maybe we have time for a second round for maybe two th or three more questions. Have you also maybe a question for Rakesh and Prasad? Yeah, thank you very much. So there was one question, how can we overcome the dilemma of yeah, the higher costs or the green chemicals are more costly and they have to serve as well the or have to keep the final cost of the product low. I think uh, we have heard already that we have to consider the overall, yeah, we have to go for a holistic approach and not just considering the price per kilogram of chemicals. We heard from Rene the saving of water, energy, things like that, and which all this needs to be considered. But nevertheless, I would like to ask Prasad, within ZHC, there you are bringing a lot of brands together. And as we also heard from Klaus Kümmerer, that sometimes the cost saving you have to consider on the long term, whatever. What are the answers of the brand to this question when it comes to higher cost yeah, regarding um, when they want to go for greener chemicals? Well, I think uh, it, it depends on uh, what is the strategy of the individual brand. I mean, there are brands which are focusing on greener chemistry, which are focusing on safer chemistry. And uh, personally, I think because I have also spent about 25 years uh, in manufacturing and selling chemicals, uh, I think it's a misnomer that uh, greener chemistry uh, always leads to increased costs. Uh, there is a tendency, as all of us said, you know, that there is a tendency of a textile manufacturer to look at uh, a per kilo cost uh, in terms of the recipe cost. But when you look at the total cost, I mean, it's up to the chemical company to really measure, monitor and convince the textile manufacturer to look at total cost and, and provide statistics that yes, at, at the end of the day, whether it is in terms of uh, resource efficiency or increased productivity, you do save costs with, with greener chemistry. But with respect to the brands, uh, I mean, all the signatory brands of ZDHC, they are uh, they are now having a unified or harmonized MRSL as to which they all agree. And they do push uh, the adoption and implementation of these MRSL in their supply chain. Uh, I would not be able to really answer what they would uh, do with respect to uh, any uh, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, feedback from the suppliers about increased costs. But I, I would agree with Ulrich uh, that, you know, most of the uh, chemicals which are listed in our gateway, I don't think there is a very huge difference in the costs when you compare it with the uh, conventional chemicals. Thank you very much. Then I have another very technical two, three more very technical questions where you may give a very short reply. First one to you, Ulrich. Is Dystar specifically focusing on synthesizing completely mineralized dye stuff, which can be completely eliminated in the conventional ETP of a textile wet processing facility? Yeah, we have pigment formulations for printing, which can also be used for dyeing, but that is only range uh, for kind of mineralized dye stuff. Um, if we talk about reactive dyes or acid dyes or basic dyes, 
yeah, that are water soluble dyes. Uh, we don't focus on that. No, to make it short, no, we don't have such a project in the moment. Thank you very much. And one concrete question to you, Fassad. How many tests are required for screen chemistry certificates? And what about ZHC level three? So screen chemistry is um, uh, an individual uh, initiative by some of the uh, brands where uh, they are using some third party certifications uh, for screening the ingredients in uh, a formulation against certain uh, available public databases for hazards. So uh, this is uh, going a little beyond uh, uh, just the MRSL conformance and looking at all kinds of hazards uh, in the ingredients based on the uh, percentages used. And that is what screen chemistry is all about. Uh, of course, the MRSL level three is uh, looking at not just the ingredient uh, uh, hazards, but also the product stewardship systems at, <coughs> at the chemical manufacturer to ensure consistent uh, MRSL uh, conformance and responsible manufacturing. Uh, going ahead, uh, ZDHC is working on a formulations to zero leader program in which we will be incorporating these principles of screen chemistry also. So I would not uh, elaborate on that as of now, but yes, we will be integrating these principles in our formulations to zero leader program quite soon. Thank you, Prasad. Maybe just one more time, the opportunity to Rakesh to respond to anything he has heard. Is there anything you would like to add or to underline? Well, I want to only share what we have seen and what we experience uh, with regards to frustration. Frustration from policymakers who represent the interest of consumers and citizens. I mean, the topic of fixing things from the design started off and the idea of greener chemistry came out in the 1990s with the US Pollution Preventing Act, Prevention Act, which said from the design and change of raw materials to eliminate pollution, yeah. In 1991, there was already topic of atom economy. In 1998, the 12 principles of green chemistry were there. In 2007, we had REACH SVHCs. We heard of Psychem in late 2009-10. We had the International Conference on Green and Sustainable Chemistry in what 2010 again. And then came the ISC3, which we see in the background for Dr. Klaus Kummerer. What we see now from policymakers is the frustration to say now, OK, uh, no more self-regulation. Let's go on the side. We come out with regulation. There's the chemical strategy of Europe, which is clear, which is moving and saying we are going to raise the bar. There is all the requirement on PFAS. Uh, in Europe, you see the PFAS state move. You see what uh, US is doing also. So we see now uh, the policymakers, the regulators integrating this within policy and telling the industry, hey, listen, great work, but 30% of the industry doing the right thing is not same as everybody doing the right thing. So we're just going to raise the bar up. Uh, so all we can say is everybody out there, cost is important, but uh, soon we go in the direction of compliance. Yeah, so uh, the discussion goes on the side. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, before I call on Gundolf to summarize maybe three key takeaways from our webinar series, especially from today. Um, by profession, I'm also a futurist. So having these five experts here in the room, I just wanted to give everybody 30 seconds. This is, of course, you're not aware of that question. 30 seconds. What is your hope or your vision for the next in the for the next five to 10 years in regard to green chemistry? Anybody who wants to go first? I mean, uh, Dr. Klaus already made a nice statement and I felt like this would be a very nice closing remarks. But nevertheless, 30 seconds from each of you. Is that possible? Uh, maybe yeah. um, Passat, like you go first. Yeah, so uh, my wish or dream would be that consumers understand chemistry and there is a push from the consumers. I mean, if there is a push from the consumers, uh, which is uh, sadly missing as of now. I mean, if you put a product which we uh, say is greener, 
it is not necessary that the consumer buys mm. it. it 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 still yeah, always looks at the price so i think a little uh, a dream is that uh, if the consumers understand what is this uh, uh, greener chemistry about and they push for more greener products thank you prasad who would guy like to go next maybe rane I uh, yeah this this is a big challenge but i i would go on the on the 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 expectation or the wish that uh, basically the, the the manufacturers are starting to focus on what is the business case for them. So the business case is something different than cost per of chemicals. So what's the business case? How material are the, is the selection of chemicals? And then uh, once that is, uh, that is, that is done, then uh, basically start with the essentials first. So get your house in order, get rid of chemicals you don't use anymore, rationalize, and then get rid of the nasty ones, which is the basically the, the restricted substances. And then some of you, uh, some of them will then start to look at where, what is opportunities to differentiate and to lead by example. So my my wish is really that uh, seeing chemicals as a as a cost to seeing chemicals as as how material are they to your business success. That would make a lot of difference. Thank you, Rene. Ulrich. Yeah, uh, if I agree with both of you. Um, yeah, don't look to the cost. Only on the cost. Uh, in, in in German, the textile finishing is textile veredelung. You add some more value to the textile. Yeah, uh, that is the key. That that is the reason why we do all this textile industry to make something fancy, a shirt or whatever, out of uh, raw material. Uh, in future, we sh we have to take a look for more green chemistry, and I think we are on the right track. The chemical industry is on the right track. We have to do some more, uh, but training of the consumer is necessary to yeah, slow down this fast fashion. Thank you, Ulrich. Um, Rakesh. Well, on one hand, I'm outraged. I'm outraged that it's been three decades since the topic of greener chemistry came out and we are still talking and not, it's not mass market. But I'm also optimistic from all the nice case studies which are out there from the consortium. For example, when GIZ brings together policymakers, uh, experts, university and industry and regulations come up. Yeah, so both. Mm, thanks, Rakesh. And Klaus. Yeah, my vision would be that green chemistry is well established everywhere in the textile industry, but that there's also a lot of consciousness that it's only a building block and it's only it has to fit in into a more simplified, less complex textile chemistry, textile product world. So uh, a real broad understanding and implementation of green chemistry and the notation, the knowledge that it's not all just going for greener. It's only a building block, and as Rene said nicely, um, think of your business case and not just the Thank chemicals. You. Thank you, Dr. Klaus. Thank you so much, all five of you, gentlemen. I think this was a very interesting uh, exchange here. And Gundolf, you have also been given the last task to give us three key takeaways. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the three key takeaways if we consider the whole three sessions. The first one is we need a shift of the mindset. Second one, we need more capacity development and more knowledge. Then the third one is definitely green chemistry is beneficial for all. I would like to elaborate a bit more what does it mean yeah, and why I came to that. So shift of the mindset, if we Consider a bit the ongoing discussion. Also, what was said today, there are um, manufacturers which are requesting specific chemis chemicals because they are using them for ages. Yeah, we know that brands are aware about, but and so on. It's a bit. Um, if you look into psychologists, then there is well known a bit um, what describes it the locked-in syndrome. Yeah, everybody is aware about, but nobody is moving. Of course, it's a bit the extreme on that. Nevertheless, what we need, we need a shift. We need more awareness about we have to be sustainable. We have to move. We have to consider that um, it is sustainable. Um, we have to consider the long term on that. We have to 
change as well as a consumer our habits. Sometimes I'm also asked in you know, privately or my family since I'm working somehow in textile, what can I do? Uh, what is a more sustainable? Where can I buy? My, the answer from my side is always the most, most sustainable garment is the one you are not buying. And I think um, that's a bit what we need to consider. Fast fashion, however um, it is, or how, however, um, what kind of greener chemicals you're using. Nevertheless, you're using resources. Also, when we consider the circularity, we don't have a 100% circularity. There is no closed loop, not in the near future. Yeah, And I think that is a bit all stakeholders along the supply chain have to do the best to make it more sustainable. And that's um, also from the manufacturer, change your recipes, be open to that, ask your chemical man, um, suppliers, they can help you, they can support you. Also the brands consider the end of life of your products also in the design, that's what we heard in the first session. Yeah, we have to design products in a way that they are easier to recycle, that's uh, easier biocredibility, that they are less polluting the environment. Capacity development, the second key takeaway, um, of course, to achieve the mindset, we need much more knowledge, we need more capacity, we also have their, uh, let's say, with extended producer responsibility, also the provider of chemical chemicals can do still more in a way um, be more transparent, be more supportive to your customers, the manufacturer, but also on site, it's more needed. What can be done? Maybe also, um, yeah, also along the supply chain, designers, design department within the brands, they are still often not interlinked with the department for sustainability. Yeah, it's better. Some brands are using that more and more, but the designer is focusing on the color and that's what we heard about. The customer requirements. Can we achieve the same quality of the customer requirements? What does it matter if the shade is slightly different of the pink, if it's a bit lighter, a bit whatever? But consider really um, what does it mean at the end when the product is being used? And then green chemistry, yes. We have seen, and I think here it's very much important that we have to consider that being more sustainable is always beneficial on the long term. Unfortunately, the business explicitly when it comes to fast fashion is focusing on short term. You now, what comes next? What are the products of the next season? Me as a producer, I have, I cannot um, sustain without any order coming in every month, whatever. But on the long term, we definitely have to consider that being more sustainable is also beneficial for producer, um, suppliers, brands and customers. Thank you very much, Gundol, for the three key takeaways. And that's it. I mean, we had three Tuesdays together. And many of our attendees have participated in all three and also some of our resource persons and speakers also have attended all three. I thank you all very much for joining us for this webinar series on green chemistry. A special thank you to our speakers today, Dr. Klaus, Ulrich, Rakesh, René and Prasad and of course also to Gundolf. I have special thanks to the organizing team but, and there are quite a number of people. And I also see um, but uh, Mr. Ajamand, Mr. Nur, Mr. Lutful, Mr. Jürgen Post, and many others I probably forget. And I also I see also other speakers. I see um, Mr. Paul here in, uh, on the camera. Thanks everybody for making this happen. And uh, referring to what Rakesh said, I hope uh, we don't need another 30 years to see a major impact. And let's make our textile and garment industry much, much greener as fast as possible. We know we don't have much time. Um, and I understand from the presentation of um, Dr. René that it's very, very important that the garment and fashion industry or textile industry plays its part as being the second biggest polluters, I think, if I saw it correctly. And so everybody, let's do it together. I understand we all have to play a role, consumers, manufacturers, producers, users. 
So let's do it. Have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And please visit the asiagarmenthub.net if you want to share that uh, video. Also, please share the website. And uh, if possible, we will make all PowerPoints you have seen in the last three sessions available, depending if we get the right from our presenters. So that's it from my side. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you care. very much. See you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank time. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. And press Bye -bye. on the link for the feedback if you haven't done so.